Wisconsin campus and in fact in the field in general. I think rather than uh, going through a litany of his accomplishments, I, instead I think I'll tell you a story about his uh, teaching in that I was an undergraduate here and in fact took Genetics 466 from Jim Crow and as all of you I think can remember from your undergraduate days, it's not uncommon for there to be all sorts of rumors and impossible stories about various faculty, especially if they're a little bit colorful, and Jim was no exception to that. But he was the only person that I can recall about whom the stories were complimentary. Now, <laughs> that doesn't make them any more believable or true, <laughs> maybe less so. Uh, also, I think for most of you that have been here for a while, uh, or even just a year, you are aware that on the commencement of Jim's so-called active retirement, he was honored by an international gathering of geneticists here in Madison last June, the so-called Crow Fest. And for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to review this document of that event, I recommend it to you. It's entertaining reading, especially the short biography of Jim Crow. So I think without further ado, I'd like to present uh, the Department of Genetics grand young man, Jim Crow. I'm told you have to wear this. All right. I'm going to take these out. How's this from the standpoint of hearing me? I've uh, followed the standard custom of uh, putting the names of my associates in this program on the blackboard, as is always done in seminars. The only thing I haven't done is have an illegible uh, gel to show to you. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm talking mainly to the new graduate students. The rest of you are going to hear some things that you already know. Uh, one thing I'm going to start off with, which you probably don't know, and that is that if you've gambled on the green out in front of the genetics building, you've noticed there's a statue at the head of Henry Mall. And the statue is not Henry. It's uh, W. Day Horde, W. D. Horde, the first of my names up here. Uh, he was a former governor of the state and a great dairy cattle enthusiast. He published a journal called Horde's Dairyman for many years. And later he was the president of the Regents. And while he was president of the Board of Regents, he founded the genetics department, essentially by insisting that the uh, College of Agriculture start a program in breeding. So in 1910, our department started under the name Experimental Breeding. Uh, this led to so many bad jokes, or, or perhaps to the same bad joke so many times, uh, that the <laughs> people very quickly decided they should change the name but they couldn't do it until 1918. They had to wait for Mr. Horde to die. He <laughs> insisted from the beginning that genetics was a word known only to the esoteric and that the name experimental breeding would have to last, which it did until his death. Uh, we've had, or used to have at least, a friendly rivalry with the University of California as to which was the oldest genetics department. And each of us can make a claim. We're the oldest department if you don't count changes of names. They're the oldest department to have been continuously named genetics. I'm going to confine my discussion mostly about people, uh, to people who have departed, either by death or by their own feet. Uh, I'll omit current faculty. I have to live with them. <laughs> In, uh, from uh, 1910, the year of its origin, until 1919, uh, this was a one-man department. It was L.J. Cole. He was here his first four years, and during that time wrote one paper on X-linked inheritance in pigeons. He certainly wouldn't have got promoted in this year or gotten a grant. Uh, he was a zoologist, naturalist, animal behaviorist, and especially he loved pigeons. And he liked nothing better than to do almost any kind of an experiment as long as it involved pigeons. Uh, curiously, he had no experience whatsoever in agriculture. And I think it was, shows a bit of insight on the part of the then dean named Russell uh, 
uh, to uh, start a program in basic research in the College of Agriculture at a time when that wasn't the, the popular thing to do. Some of the research that was done by Cole or instigated by him was, of course, pigeons, as I've said, uh, color pattern, hybrid sterility, lethal genes, and blood groups. He studied chickens, he studied the effects of inbreeding, and he was especially interested in sex reversal, phenotypic sex reversal, which was a popular subject at that time. He also started a program in fur-bearing mammals, and I'm glad to see that Max Shackelford, who worked with him on this program, is in the audience. Uh, foxes and mink especially were studied, and this was one place in which simple Mendelian inheritance uh, could, be, could quickly and easily be applied to uh, problems of great practical value. Uh, among other things, one of the popular colors, coat colors, uh, turned out to be lethal and homozygous, and Shackelford and Cole were able to tell breeders uh, how to make their matings in such a way as to avoid this uh, lethal problem. Uh, the biggest part of his program, the only agricultural part of the program, was an attempt to uh, cross beef cattle and dairy cattle and get an all-purpose animal out of this. Uh, it was low budget times, usually low budget at Wisconsin, uh, and he was unable uh, to buy high quality cattle. And it was embarrassing for him to have these scrub cattle on the state institution campus while all the breeders out through the state had purebred strains. And he hit on a magnificent idea. He was going to cross Holsteins and Aberdeen Angus, both of which are black, but both of which are segregating for a red color gene, which is the kiss of death. Uh, on that particular animal, at least, because it's usually quickly killed and sold for veal and hushed up. Um, what uh, Cole did was simply buy up these red calves from these two breeds, which of course were genetically in every other color regard except color, uh, just as good as any others. He could get them for a very, very cheap price, and he was able to do some pretty good experiments because of this. Uh, he let his students do pretty much what they wanted to do. Uh, one of the students was Bill Dove's father. And he did an experiment on uh, tissue autographs, uh, especially transplanting of bones from one part of the body to the other, usually one part of the head to, the, to another part. Uh, and his most famous contribution was a unicorn in which it had a single head, a single horn, uh, growing directly out of the forehead. That was done after he left Wisconsin, but he did the early part of the work, work here. Another of Cole's well-known students was Ray Owen, and I'll say more about him in a moment. Altogether, though, the cattle results were inconclusive, and Horde, the founder of the department, was disappointed, and the College of Agriculture uh, took a dim view of the genetics department. They weren't especially interested in pigeons, and the cattle uh, work was a fiasco, as I said. And it took many years, according to Brink, for the department to live down its uh, reputation of being not too good in the College of Agriculture. Uh, Cole did have a good national reputation. Uh, he spent a great deal of time on national committee work, and Brink once told me, once told me uh, that Cole uh, had considerable regrets in his later life, that he'd spent so much time on this sort of activity that he didn't get a chance to do the kind of research that he might really have liked to have done. He was a very kindly man, scholarly, loved by all. He worked very hard, and his students did, by example, rather than by fiat. Although he had one device to guarantee student participation, he scheduled conferences regularly early on Sunday morning, uh, which was part of his uh, tactic for getting people to work. I, one of my regrets is never having met this great man. It would have been a source of great satisfaction for me if I could, could claim a continuity with the departments of beginnings, but I can't. I came here for an interview in January 1948 at that time, Cole was out of town, and then when I came here to stay in the following summer, meanwhile, he had died, so I've never had a chance to meet him. As I said, until the year 1919, uh, there was only one man in the department. Then they decided there should be a plant geneticist, and E.W. Lindstrom was brought here in 1919. He stayed only two years, and he left for a good reason. He was mainly interested in establishing a program of hybrid corn, which was just beginning to be understood as being important, agriculturally important. Uh, 
Uh, he couldn't get the rest of the College of Agriculture interested in hybrid corn, and so he left and went to Iowa State and was there for many years afterward. Uh, one of the great dates in the history of this department is 1922. Uh, that's the year that R.A. Brink uh, came here. He was to be a successor to Lindstrom. He was Canadian. He grew up on a farm. He went to college almost entirely on his own against the opposition, or at least the absence of any encouragement uh, from his parents, and worked a great deal, finally got through. Then he got himself a fellowship at the University of Illinois, stayed there one year, then transferred to Harvard, stayed there one year, and that's the extent of his graduate work. It's quite a contrast to the present life of having several years of sheltered graduate and postdoctoral experience. Uh, Brink came immediately after these two years to Wisconsin. Uh, during that first year, he was energetic, I needn't tell you. Uh, during that first year, he started two courses, he finished his thesis, and most important, he was politically astute and was somehow able to get the cooperation of the relevant other departments on the campus in getting a program in hybrid corn started. So although the practical work was carried out by Dr. Neal for several years, uh, the program was really instigated by Brink, and it was a political tour de force uh, to have gotten started when he did. The first... Uh, Wisconsin Hybrid was released in 1933 for agricultural usage, and eight years later, 90% of the corn in the state uh, was hybrid corn. One of the other Brink discoveries, or a Brink discovery, the hybrid corn was simply something he put forth, uh, was a winter resistant strain of alfalfa. This was opportunistic research at, at its best. Uh, there was a winter with a particularly heavy freeze and Brink just happened to notice that a few alfalfa plants survived. So he picked those plants, bred from them, and backcrossed them and intercrossed other kinds of genes that were, that were agronomically desirable, and ended up with a winter resistant, otherwise highly desirable strain of alfalfa. It was called Vernal. 17 years later, that it actually, he'd done all the breeding required to get this uh, strain established. And for many years, and for all I know it still is, uh, the most popular of the alfalfa varieties. I think the introduction of this strain of alfalfa and the introduction of hybrid corn uh, must be about as important a contribution to the economy of the state, and the nation for that matter, as the College of Agriculture ever made. But it's, all, it's been a source of regret to me that, uh, this is for Bob Burr's benefit, <laughs> that, the, uh, that the discoveries made in biochemistry are patentable and that those made in plant breeding usually aren't, or weren't back in those days. Hence, the problems we have. Uh, one, more, uh, <laughs> one more practical discovery in which Brink played a part. Uh, he and W.K. Smith uh, discovered that a bitter-tasting clover was a cause of hemorrhagic disease in cattle. Uh, Smith did the genetics and worked out the inheritance of this particular trait. And then Mark Stauman and Carl Paul Link, <coughs> excuse me, of the chemistry department, did the chemistry of this and you all know the end result, the discovery of dicumarol, and later the product warfarin, which has its dual uses as an anticoagulant and as a, as a rat poison. Brink, I have not Brink, Link, always insisted that warfarin, that rats could never develop a resistance to warfarin. Made no sense, uh, and he and I argued about it. And in the sense I won the argument, I'll tell you about it. Uh, that the rats, of course, did become resistant to warfarin in uh, due course. Um, Brink's real love, however, was basic research, and whenever he could spare the time, he returned to it. One of the things he did, he and Cooper, was the cytological demonstration of crossing over. He doesn't get much credit for this uh, because he was scooped by two other people. One was Kurt Stern, and the second was Barbara McClintock, and the publications came in the order Stern, McClintock, Brink. Uh, so he was pretty largely forgotten. He did it independently, though, and it was an important thing at the time. Uh, what he really wanted to study was mutable genes. And he actually resigned from the chairmanship of genetics because it was taking too much of his time, and he wanted more to devote to his, uh, to his studies of work that's now well known. Uh, he studied the phenomenon of paramutation. He was courageous enough to use the uh, 
to study the pericarp, uh, where the ear is the unit rather than the kernel, and only with the large uh, acreage at his disposal could he do this kind of a could he do this kind of a study. To a large extent, his work paralleled that of McClintock. I think that uh, McClintock's popularity owes quite a bit to Brink, because uh, although McClintock's papers were notoriously hard to understand, uh, Brink's papers were correspondingly easy, and in many ways I think he helped her cause a great deal. However, I should say that he always insisted that she is the one that should have the credit. He had great admiration for her originality and seemingly sixth sense. One more thing about Brink. His loyalty to the department and to the university was absolute. He took a very paternal interest in the institution and in its younger faculty, people like me. He tried very hard to protect me from getting into too many things, somewhat unsuccessfully. Uh, he once told me I was spending too much time on music. He didn't, he didn't say this directly, but I got the, I got the message. Uh, and of course, I paid no attention to him, and uh, he, he never raised the point again. Uh, the, uh, I really count Brink as one of my heroes, and uh, uh, his, uh, his contribution to this department is, is uh, perhaps the greatest of all. Uh, the next to join the Wisconsin faculty was M.R. Irwin. He was an immunologist, and he had two main accomplishments. One was he joined coal, working with pigeons, naturally, and he showed that uh, species differences in the antigens of pigeons uh, could be resolved in simple Mendelian terms, something that doesn't seem very significant now, uh, but was at the time. The other thing he started was a program of cattle blood groups. And very quickly, uh, knowledge of cattle blood groups became the most extensive of blood group knowledge of any organism. And it was quickly put to use for various kinds of practical things, but especially for paternity testing, which as soon as uh, artificial insemination came, became a popular thing, there were frequent disputes about paternity, and the blood grouping was one way of, of making a test of this. The most important of the discoveries by far, though, uh, during that period, was the work of Ray D. Owen. Uh, Ray Owen was, was the person who noticed in Irwin's lab that uh, in cattle twins, fraternal twins, that frequently, in fact usually, uh, the twins were both mosaic for blood cells, uh, the result of, the, of a transfusion of cells from, two, from the two embryos. Uh, this was remarkable enough in itself, but Ray was perceptive enough to realize that, that the fact that these cattle didn't agglutinate their own cells must imply something that we would now call immune tolerance. And in a way, this is the beginning of that particular subject. And it's very much to Owens, and I'm sure Irwin played a role, uh, part to realize the significance of this. When Medawar got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of immune tolerance, uh, he made quite a point of mentioning Ray Owen in this, in this context. Owen later moved to Caltech and is known to many of you. Brink was single-handedly responsible for Wisconsin's greatest genetic coup, and that's Joshua Lederberg and the beginning of uh, molecular biology at Wisconsin. It wasn't easy for Brink. Uh, Josh was a medical student at Columbia, and like most medical students, was bored, uh, and then decided to do some bacterial experiments in his spare time. Uh, he was impressed with the idea that the antigenic variation in Salmonella seemed to be more, more or less permutational in nature. That is, a small number of units permuted in many ways. And that shouted out to him a uh, recombination, and he decided it was worth looking for. Uh, he was certainly not the first person to look for recombination in bacteria. Uh, several people hadn't had and had failed, but everyone else who had previously looked for this uh, did it by methods that were not sensitive enough to detect recombination unless it were happening of something of the order of 10% or higher. What Lederberg realized is this might be a very rare event, and one would have to do something strongly selective in order to detect recombinants. The very first, he took a leave from uh, medical school, uh, went to work at Yale with Tatum, and the very first experiment worked. That's pretty lucky when you think about all of the uh, regulation of recombination in bacteria now, that he happened to pick two strains that were F plus and F minus, and that happened to be linked 
use link markers in such a way that free recombination had occurred. In any case, it worked. And uh, uh, Letterberg was chosen by Brink as the person to start a program in microbial genetics at the university. Most of the department wanted someone else, or at least didn't want him. Uh, they wanted someone more agriculturally oriented. And here was Josh, a New York City kid, brash, not at all inhibited by false modesty, uh, and uh, um, just not what the rest of the genetics department wanted. Uh, when he uh, was taken to be interviewed with by uh, Dean Baldwin, the then dean here, Dean Baldwin asked him if he had ever lived on a farm, and uh, the reputed answer is, is, no, in fact, I never saw grass till I was 12 years old. And uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about this is that exactly one year later, when I came to be interviewed by Baldwin, he asked me if I'd ever lived on a farm. Happily, I had for about six months, so I passed that particular exam. Uh, it's uh, sad to read the correspondence uh, regarding Letterberg. Uh, since the department is, for the most part, were opposed, uh, Brink sought to get letters from outside the university about him. And uh, there was a great deal of skepticism. Uh, Sturdivant, based mainly on Delbrook's work, uh, was distrustful of the experiments themselves. And there were a couple of people who expressed personal dislikes. And there were a few letters, one letter really, unbelievable as it seems today, that was frankly anti-Semitic. Somehow Brink pushed it through. And Cassida, a then member of the department who had opposed Letterberg's appointment, told me later that he was almost ready to forgive Brink for the way he pushed this through. Uh, since Lederberg had really turned out to be quite good, but wasn't really willing to forget him for it. <laughs> in any case, he came here in 1947, and uh, that was the beginning of molecular genetics at the university, and of course, we can all be thankful. In particular, I can be thankful, for Lederberg is responsible for my being here. Uh, we met at Cold Spring Harbor in 1947 at the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium of that year. It's clearly the most important conference I ever attended. Uh, because that's my meeting with Lederberg and therefore my being here. Uh, the subject was nucleic acids. This was in the day before Shargaff's rules, and mostly it was blind groping for something meaningful about nucleic acid or even questioning whether nucleic acid was meaningful. I met Shargaff. I guess I have to admit I thought he was a bit dumb, but I've had ample chance to change my mind <laughs> since, <laughs> since that time. Uh, there was an unscheduled evening talk by Letterberg. Uh, it started about 7 o'clock and lasted till about 11, in which he reported uh, the then brand new discoveries of uh, microbial genetics. By then, he had the beginnings of a chromosome map. Um, most of the audience were protein and nucleic acid chemists and not acquainted with the minutia of genetics. Uh, I was, uh, got Josh's attention by realizing that uh, since he was only selecting recombinants and didn't know what the, the uh, number of non-recombinants was, he had to make some assumption about the interference function. So I raised this question, and we instantly became friends. Um, and he recommended me for a position here, perhaps for better reasons than one question. Uh, I came here a year later, and my first uh, visit with the Letterbergs, Josh and Esther, they had a, a laboratory and office, everything, in one room in the basement of the old genetics building, it was about 16 feet square, Josh was there, Esther was there, Norton Zender, who was then a student, was in the room, two student dishwashers, all in this one room, about 16 by 16. It was July, it was a suffocatingly hot day, and how they could get anything done uh, is a little beyond my understanding. I think the university should put up a plaque on this building, you know, over this basement room, and point out that this is where some quite remarkable, why do I say quite, overwhelmingly remarkable work got done. We were all crowded at that time, even I. Uh, I had a makeshift, makeshift lab in a temporary building where the present plant pathology building is. It was cold in the winter and hot in the summer. I think the building was jinxed. Of my first three students, one got in a sex scandal and the other one falsified his data, and they both <laughs> dropped out. I'm happy to say that they've both gone on to uh, happy careers in other fields, and especially the one who falsifies data, 
became an advertising copywriter on Madison <laughs> Avenue in New York, and it's a poetic license. <laughs> <laughs> My first postdoc was equally jinxed. This was Wari Kerr, who was the person who first brought African bees from Africa to Brazil. Uh, this has almost ruined his life, I'm sorry to say. Uh, he's a great uh, scientist, a great geneticist, and had this one unfortunate experience, which for the most part wasn't his fault, but uh, more about that some other time. Anyhow, after moving back to the genetics building, the jig stopped and I had a succession of brilliant graduate students and postdocs. Sorry for this exercise in self-indulgence. I'll get back to the Letterberg. Uh, in a few years, he really accomplished a remarkable amount. Recombination, transduction, abortive transduction, HFR, F-factor, lysogeny, lambda, replica plating, action of penicillin, protoplasts, L-forms, phase variation in salmonella. Can't mention lambda without uh, recalling one thing. I was very eager at one time uh, to uh, attract Dale Kaiser to Wisconsin on the fa as a faculty member and um, was unsuccessful for what was given as a very good reason. We already had two people working on lambda and the organism wasn't big enough to deserve more than, more than two. Uh, how many lambda geneticists are there now? Anyhow, more than any such, or I guess fewer than there were a few years ago. Uh, Lederberg had an amazing intellect. Everybody knows this. Every evening he took a stack of books home, and every evening, every morning, brought them back. Uh, nobody believed he read them, but I did. Uh, I had, uh, the first week I was here, I had read a paper by... Um, Rayla, Rayla Timmons' uncle, who was a statistician at the Mayo Clinic, uh, that had a point in it that I was interested in. So I gave it to Josh to read, and he read it at the rate of about 10 seconds per page, something like that, thumbed through the pages. And after he got through, I said to look at this page particularly, because that's what I want to discuss, but he didn't have to. He knew that part uh, perfectly well. Um, whenever there was almost any question that came up, he had the answer. There was one argument going on in the genetics library about the Einstein equations and which relationship between mass, velocity, and uh, uh, at, uh, I mean, mass at high velocity is what I want to say. And everybody was thoroughly confused on this. Letterberg gave a short lecture on the Einstein equations and everybody was, was happy. The, uh, the best of these, though, is the, when Carl Sagan was a student here, uh, Carl had some idea about the possibility of life on the moon, below the surface of the moon. And he told me about it. And I thought it was a pretty good idea. And he, say, he said he'd like to tell Letterberg, but he was a little afraid. And I said, well, he's not so fearsome. Just go in and tell him. But uh, Carl, who was more modest in those days than he is now, <laughs> uh, said, that, uh, <laughs> said that he'd like to think about it and rehearse it. So he did. So I arranged for a meeting that evening. Uh, he came in. Uh, with about four points to present. He presented point one, Lederberg nodded his head, presented point two, and Lederberg nodded his head, got ready to present point three, and Lederberg said, yes, I think that's right. Said from point one and point two, it follows that this is true and this is true, and that was the end of the discussion. Uh, I should say that uh, Sagan followed Lederberg to uh, Stanford when he went there and, was, and had the distinction for a while of being the only astronomer that was a member of a genetics department. Uh, just a few more personal anecdotes, just one more. Uh, I, uh, Letterberg exploited some people, but I exploited him. Uh, I filed information with him. I soon learned that whatever I couldn't remember, he would. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and then I would get, get the information back uh, in a carefully refined form, considerably better than the initial input, better than most, <laughs> one of the... The, the example of this that's uh, most vivid in my mind, one of the few things that I knew that he didn't was a mapping function, the Kosambi mapping function. And so one day I derived this for, for him. And then a year or two later, uh, I was trying to reconstruct that in mind, and I simply couldn't remember it. It was about 9 o'clock at night, and Josh breezed into my office and wanted to know what I was doing, and I told him I was trying to derive this formula, so he did it for me. And as far as I know, he hadn't thought of it in those intervening periods. <laughs>
he, after he left here, he wrote a weekly column for the uh, Washington Post and the Capital Times, which at that time had the Washington Post service, uh, ran this column. But not very many people were interested in reading it, apparently, so they stopped running it. So I wrote them and then the letter said that they should run it. And they did, and then they stopped again, and I wrote another letter. And then finally I started calling them every time they omitted the, the column. And um, my daughter, who was a good friend at that time of the daughter of the then editor of the Capital Times, uh, <laughs> overheard a uh, phone conversation in which, um, this was Elliot Marinus, uh, in, in which he was saying, well, I guess, we I guess we better run another Letterberg column, otherwise I'll get a phone call from Crow. So <laughs> they did. Uh, I'm sorry it didn't stay, but that's, that's life. Uh, the uh, next name that I want to mention uh, is Sewell Wright. The person who deserves the major credit for bringing Wright here is M.R. Irwin. Uh, he was able to get funds from the Wisconsin Lunar Research Foundation uh, to support Wright. Wright. Uh, I suppose this is the biggest financial bargain that Wisconsin's ever gotten because Wright uh, retired at age 65 from the University of Chicago and our retirement age here was 70. And so uh, Wisconsin got him for those five years, and they didn't pay him a full salary. They simply paid him the difference between the Chicago retirement faculty, the sa retirement uh, salary, and what he would get here as a faculty member. So they got, so Wisconsin got right for five years, plus all the years since, uh, for paying him five years of a, of a part-time salary. Um, Wright's father, incidentally, must have been a remarkable man. He taught at Lombard College in Galesburg, Illinois, which is where Wright went to school. He taught English, math, astronomy, surveying, physical education, and economics. Uh, the, uh, one of his students was Carl Sandburg, and uh, Sewell Wright has the privilege of having, they ran a printing press, he and his brother, and they printed the first edition of any of Carl Sandburg's poems. Uh, Wright was an early bloomer, uh, he knew how to read and write before he ever started school. He was held back one year because he was so small, so he started school a year later than people usually do, and of course knew far more. Uh, the thing that I enjoy most telling about that period is that Wright knew how to take cube roots. And I said cube roots, not square roots, uh, when he was before he started school. And when he, um, when he went to the first grade, the teacher asked him if he, if he knew any mathematics or arithmetic, knew if he knew how to cipher, probably what she said. And he said that he knew how to take cube roots. Well, the teacher didn't believe it, of course. Uh, so he demonstrated it, and she was so impressed that she took him to the eighth grade class, and he apparently could just barely reach up to the blackboard, but anyhow, he extracted the cube roots that were given to him, and uh, uh, much to the surprise of everybody. According to Wright, this had only one consequence. It made him instantly and permanently unpopular with all the other students, and he never, never again volunteered information like this in, in class. Uh, he uh, went to college at this same um, Lombard College in Illinois. His teacher there was Wilhelmina Key, the key is the same key as Francis Scott key. She's a descendant of the Star Spangled Banner. Um, more interesting to us, uh, she was a student of E.A. Burge here at Wisconsin, the Burge after which Burge Call is, is named, and got a PhD degree at the University of Chicago. Uh, she was the person who inspired Wright to become a geneticist, and they learned genetics by reading the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition article which was written by, uh, by Punnett. Uh, between his uh, junior and senior years, instead of going abroad, uh, he spent the year as a surveyor on, uh, for a railroad being laid in the Dakotas. Uh, they soon discovered his mathematical ability, and he did the calculations required for doing the spiral curves uh, in the, for making bends in the railroad, in the railroad track. Uh, this was a territory and inhabited almost entirely by Indians, this was only 19 years after the Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, Wright still remembers a number of words of Sioux dialect, and if you ask him to, he will recite uh, well more of these than you really want to hear. Uh, <laughs> during, uh, during this period, he contracted pleurisy, and uh, 
had to spend several weeks, months actually, in a caboose where he couldn't do anything but read. He, he read whatever he could get, which included one mathematics textbook. But he wasn't so sick that he couldn't climb up on top of the caboose and, uh, and view Halley's Comet, which came that year. Unfortunately, it came again this year, as everybody knows, but his eyesight didn't permit him to see it this time. Um, because of having this uh, lung infection, he couldn't get life insurance. And I've, I find it amusing that some company missed out on a pretty good deal by, uh, <laughs> by failing to give him the insurance. Uh, since, uh, since coming here, perhaps the most fortunate thing, I think, is that Wisconsin didn't have any guinea pig facilities. Wright used to spend all, a good share of his time taking care of guinea pigs. After he came here, he was no longer able to. And so from uh, the time he was here, he was able to analyze all of his earlier data and then write the four books, which everybody's familiar with. Whether everybody's read them or not, I'm less sure. I, I have one favorite anecdote about Wright that I have told many times, but I'll tell it once more for anyone who possibly hasn't heard it. Uh, when, uh, during the time he was writing these books, he had a small stipend from the National Science Foundation. And uh, the writing of the books took longer than he thought it would, and it was bothering his conscience. He has a super developed conscience. During this time, the National Science Foundation decided that they could, that they could raise his, his stipend to keep up with inflation, which was changing rather rapidly at that time. So. Um, I got a call from Washington, I was chairman of the department at the time, saying that they, could, uh, that they would increase Wright's stipend by an inflationary amount. <clears throat> so I went down, all smiles, to tell Wright about this, and he refused to accept it. He said that uh, he had done careful calculations and that his productivity was declining at the same rate that the value of the dollar, <laughs> and he wasn't worth anymore. And he never did accept this, uh, this uh, salary increase. Uh, the anticlimax of this is that um, after the deed had been done and he hadn't accepted and Mrs. Wright learned about this <laughs> and took quite a different view about this, <laughs> about his productivity. Uh, Wright is still alive, still active, and he wrote a paper about two or three months ago that's coming out in the January or February issue of the American Naturalist. Um, he said, about oh three or four years ago that he would never write another paper. He wrote one reanalyzing some of his early guinea pig studies and he had such a hard time because of his failing eyesight uh, looking at his old data that he decided this he'd never write another paper. I thought to myself at the time one way to get right to write one more paper is, is for someone else to write something criticizing his work. Well that happened and this paper is a is a response to such. I commend it to your reading. Uh, all of these things that I've been telling you uh, happened while we were still in the old genetics building across the street from the present one. Uh, we moved into the new building in 1963. And let me just mention once again some of the uh, really enormous things that were done in that incredibly crowded, uh, poorly equipped space. One was Ray, Ray Owens' Mosaic Cattle Twins. Uh, Brink's work on paramutation and transposable elements. Letterberg's monumental work. Sewell Wright did some of his best work during those years. Uh, Newton Morton was here at the time and developed the LOD score uh, for detecting linkage in human populations, to which nobody paid much attention for about 30 years, but now that it becomes feasible to do linkage in humans, uh, this is the standard method. Uh, Mota Kimura introduced stochastic processes and the uh, solution of very elaborate equations during that period here. And in the Drosophila world, uh, Eurytro Horizomy discovered segregation distortion, and he and Larry Sandler uh, did the early work on uh, developing that systems. Uh, one remark made by one person about that time is maybe worth mentioning. This was Moto Kimura. We were just moving across the street, or getting ready to, and uh, Kimura made the prediction that there were some awfully great things done in this old building, and nothing that good would ever be done again. Well, I don't want to say that, that we aren't better than we were, but, but perhaps the uh, relative to other genetic departments at the time, we perhaps stood higher then than, than now. <laughs>
I want to mention one other person, and this is the late Klaus Petal. He was associated with Timofey Prisovsky and with uh, Max Delbruck in Germany between the two wars. Uh, he came here and was associated with the botany department and the uh, pathology department doing cytology. There was a seminar in the pediatrics department that Newton Martin was going to go to, but he couldn't, so I went instead. And uh, we picked up the rumor there that uh, uh, Down syndrome was caused by trisomy. It wasn't uh, actually published, but it was being noised around. So I went back and uh, said, decided that surely Wisconsin ought to quickly get into the field of uh, human cytogenetics and talk briefly to Petal about this. He liked the idea. He and David Smith got together and decided that the way to discover additional trisomies would be to, uh, almost certainly a trisomy would result in mental retardation. So he decided to look for any patients at the uh, severely retarded colony here in, across the lake any patients that had mental retardation, of course, but had two other superficially unrelated malformations. Uh, the first day they found one, that turned out to be trisomy 13. The next day they found another, that turned out to be trisomy 18. We calculated in another 20 days, all the primary trisomies would be discovered and the human species would uh, join the Jimson weed in having a thorough trisomic analysis. The rest of you know the answer. Those two were all that there were or essentially so. Uh, but in any case, that's the beginning of cytogenetics, human cytogenetics, I should say, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, during this period, the Kennedy family were very interested in supporting work on, on the mental retardation, as they still are. And they thought that the study of human trisomies and the beginning of human cytogenetics would be a place they would really like to support their funds. Uh, Sergeant Shriver and Eunice Kennedy were here at the time. Uh, I introduced them to PayTal. They were enormously impressed. Um, Schreiber said, uh, we'll build you a laboratory and get you a Corps of Assistants. And uh, PayTal said, no thanks. Uh, he liked to work by himself. He didn't trust anybody else's cytology and continued to work as a, uh, by himself. The Kennedy Foundation went ahead and supported other work at Wisconsin, and the Weissman Institute is uh, the major consequence of this. Uh, at the time of the dedication, the Kennedy family were here again, and uh, it was only two days before the assassination of the, of the president. I want to say just a little bit about the beginnings of medical genetics at the, at the university. This was part of the vision of Joshua Lederberg and of John Bowers, the then dean of the medical school, and they decided to um, started Department of Medical Genetics. Uh, Brink was opposed to it. He thought that it might ultimately weaken the genetics department. He was eventually persuaded that this, what, that this wouldn't be the case, and of course it hasn't been. Um, about the time the department was getting established, with Lederberg taking the leadership of it, uh, then, the, then he decided to go to Stanford, and, and I was appointed chairman at the time. We got a startup grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. And I like to talk about this. Uh, I was in New York, so I sought a personal interview with Dr. Morrison, who was uh, doling out funds for the Rockefeller Foundation. I met him one morning, we talked for 15 minutes, and I came back with the money. Uh, each time I write a grant request today, <laughs> I think about those happy <laughs> times of long ago when uh, money was handled out with considerably less red tape than, than at present. That, uh, the grant was large enough to enable us to go from a staff of uh, essentially one, namely me, uh, to about five in about a year's time. Uh, we got, uh, at, during that period, uh, Oliver Smithies came in biochemical genetics, Bob DeMars in cell cultures, Klaus Peto transferred to the medical genetics program in cytogenetics, Newton Morton stayed here in human segregation and linkage analysis, the other period, that other subject, that we were eager, eager to um, develop was immunogenetics. At that time, the uh, star person in human immunogenetics was Ruggiero Cipollini. Uh, 
So I got in touch with him, offered him a job, and he accepted. And so with great delight, we had, had Cepelini on the faculty. And then I happened to be visiting a colleague from Columbia University and told him this good news, and he said, that's strange that he just accepted a position with us. <laughs> and so it turned out that Cepelini was following the Italian custom of uh, accepting all sorts of positions and not expecting to spend more than a week or so on, uh, on any one of them. So that, that sort of fell through. And uh, the, uh, the person who d did come was Charles Cotterman, who at that time had the largest collection of um, lectins uh, any, that anyone had. And the idea was to develop a program of immunogenetics based mainly on the plant sources of, uh, of antigens. Unfortunately, from the standpoint of immunogenetics, Cotterman got interested in combinatorial analysis, and the rest of it is the kind of history that you people know. In 1965, we started the custom, still in effect, of behaving as if this were one big genetics department rather than genetics and medical genetics, and with a single chairman, and it still seems to be working. Uh, I'm getting into the realm where I have to, stalk it, have to start talking about people who are still here, so it's a good time to quit. So I will. <laughs> Do we have questions? <laughs> the person that I'm most interested in any comments would be Max Shackelford. Is he here? Oh, yeah, I, th I thought I saw him a while ago. There's one anecdote about the name of the uh, department when it started. Now, I wasn't here then. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> to the intellectual activity of the department, but she is a good help me to a person who was, and mm. she was really an interesting, charming person. And at that time, as they do now, when they have meetings on the campus, you have a name. And at that time, they call it Amal Breeding. And the story goes, and she swears it's true, uh, I guess she wore a sort of business-like suit or something. She is a very handsome lady, a statuesque type, uh, downtown. And she's noticed that the men that they passed kept looking at her. <laughs> And she said, I don't know what's happened. She said, these men along here look at me. And she still had on her tag, Mrs. L.J. Cole, experimental breeding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hadn't heard that one. <laughs>